It's hard, it's hard for me to believe that, uh, that I'm the first director of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that has um, come and spoken uh, to uh, this group of people um, and, uh, during the fly-in. And, and if I have anything to do with it, I, I'll say, I'll, I'll say it, 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 I hope it won't be the last time. Um, many of you, of course, know uh, my, my friend and, and predecessor as director, um, Sam Hamilton. And, um, I think Sam was scheduled to speak before this group um, right uh, uh, after, well, uh, until his untimely death um, a couple of years ago. I'm, I'm proud to um, carry on that legacy, um, and uh, I think it's, it, in that regard, it's really special for me to be here, Sam being a personal friend um, and a colleague of mine for over, over 20 years. And, when I think about Sam, and I've, I've said this many times before, but uh, one of the most enduring uh, uh, messages I remember from Sam is his words about the relationship between the Fish and Wildlife Service and, and our state partners. And, and he used to say, uh, there should be no daylight uh, between us and our state partners. And, and, uh, and, and especially, in, I mean, that's an everyday message and it's an everyday message that I'm conveying within the Fish and Wildlife Service and an expectation uh, that that I'm holding for leaders um, in the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that that we live that um, example. It doesn't mean that we never disagree um, because we do uh, disagree from time to time. It means that we minimize those disagreements and it means when we have disagreement we have honest and frank and open uh, discussion and that we try not to air uh, those disagreements um, in public and um, and I think that's a that's a great way of, of conducting business um, and it will ensure an enduring uh, partnership and a strengthening partnership uh, going forward and and really when we're dealing with difficult times like we're dealing with now challenging fiscal and political um, environments I think it's increasingly important that we that we show no daylight uh, between a state and federal uh, partners in wildlife conservation because of the stakes. Uh, the, the job is too difficult and the stakes are too high. We're, um, for more than 15 years, the Teaming with uh, Wildlife Coalition has played a key role in, in in really doing that, bringing together a coalition where there is no daylight, um, and in uh, bringing the wildlife conservation community together to, to think and act in a strategic manner about wildlife conservation. And, and when, uh, we, when I think about that and that message in general, you know, we've all heard the words of, of Benjamin Franklin uh, after signing the Declaration of Independence. He said, we must all hang together, or most assuredly, we'll all hang separately. And as we're thinking about, again, the environment that we're in, you, you know, all of us can go home every night and watch the television and see the political divisiveness um, that exists in our world today. And, and then, given the fact that we have uh, these challenging fiscal environments, I think it's extremely important uh, that we that we hang together as a profession, as a community, and uh, when uh, and certainly when I think about those words of Ben Franklin, he certainly could have been speaking about um, an effort like this. And uh, given the odds that we're working against, the the challenges in uh, conservation that we're facing, so the the environmental challenge, the physical and the political challenges that I that I spoke about. I mean, we are really facing. Uh, difficult odds and so that notion of enhancing uh, cooperation enhancing unity within the within this community are uh, e exceedingly important and and that's uh, why the, the the coalition that's represented here is so important um, and that's why the state wildlife action plans are are so important and and I hope um, as 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 we go forward this year in the Fish and Wildlife Service, and we um, and we speak about our the, the budget, uh, the president's budget uh, for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, 
that that is a, a seamless discussion of our of how um, how the the state uh, and tribal wildlife grants and the and the state wildlife action plans in particular are the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. This is not a separate endeavor. This is not something that is nice to do. Um, this is something that uh, is really at the very heart of the of the ability of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, to be successful. We cannot be successful unless our state partners are strong and successful. And so as we go forward in, in, um, in uh, uh, working to achieve uh, the President's objectives in terms of the uh, fiscal year 2013 uh, budget proposal, the uh, proposal for funding uh, for the state um, and tribal wildlife grants, and, and the capacity that that represents at the state level um, are integral to the, the, the success of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and as you know, the, the President's budget um, uh, proposes um, to maintain funding uh, for the state and tribal wildlife grants. I certainly wish uh, that was better. And I, and I say this, I've said this on several occasions to our people in the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that, you know, I never thought, never thought that I would uh, that I would feel that a level uh, budget was a good thing um, and uh, until about a year ago <laughs> when the House of uh, Representatives uh, brought forth a budget that represented a 22 percent reduction um, in the in the budget for the US Fish and Wildlife Service and uh, and so all of a sudden level funding took on a whole new perspective um, uh, for me and and, uh, and certainly our colleagues. So as we look at um, the level funding proposed for the state and tribal grants, I consider that to be a victory of sorts. And certainly what I'm hoping is the Fish and Wildlife Service that budget as a whole, which is basically the same, a flat budget, um, and uh, that we are at a, uh, we have gotten to a, a stabilizing point in this larger budget um, situation. And so hopefully we can look ahead now one year, two years, three years, and hopefully uh, see ourselves beginning to make, make progress again in, um, in uh, achieving um, increases in funding for these important endeavors. Um, certainly the, um, the issues around match for the state, um, the state grants is important, and I think we have a good uh, proposal to adjust the match to 6535, which will hopefully uh, be a, be good news for our state partners and hopefully take off some of the pressure uh, since the states are like us feeling uh, pressure in, in in budgets and then uh, the issue of um, the issue of competitive versus a portion of funding for the program again I think um, we've seen uh, progress uh, on that front I it wasn't many years ago when I think uh, the administration was proposing all the money to be competitive, and I think it then came down to 50%, and then it was 20%, and now we're down to 13%. So, um, so I guess what I would say is I hope you feel like we've been listening to you, and uh, and we're uh, moving in the right direction. I guess I'll say. Um, but uh, so I think the president's budget um, rec recommends the right balance, or, or I won't say right. It represents a balance. Uh, uh, between apportioned and and competitive grants, and uh, I think in the current climate uh, is a is a fair uh, proposal. I understand many people in the states uh, will feel differently about that, and 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 again in that uh, spirit of uh, no daylight between us, I'll, I'll just say I respect the opinion of the states, and and I uh, I wish you good well, uh, <laughs> goodwill as, as you go forward, and and. Uh, in representing your your viewpoint and um, you know since we're all in a room and what said in the room will stay in the room I uh, you know we're on your side um, in the US Fish and Wildlife Service and um, so um, I, I, I think what I would like to say though is like all of I think all of us in this profession you can't look at what is happening in the world um, and not be sobered and you know, recently I've been trying to pay a, a little bit of attention to um, just looking at all right, what is happening 
in the world. And you know, a few months ago, I was stricken by the the news back in October that you know the that the the, the seven billionth person uh, was uh, born into into the world. So we're we're sharing this planet now with seven billion people. The uh, predictions are that uh, that will be 10 billion, uh, 9 billion by the middle of the century, and 10 billion uh, by the end of the century. And a lot of times we think about population growth, and we think about all right, that's an Asia and an Africa, you know, thing, and and that's where the most of it is. But um, one of the things that I was surprised about it was. Um, the, the, the United States is the third most populous uh, country in the world. And when I, a few, few months ago, the Washington Post had a series on population, and I was reading the article, and I asked my wife, I said, so who are the, who are the top three countries in the nation uh, in terms of population? She got one and two right away, China and India, right? And then it was uh, Brazil, Indonesia, no, Brazil, no, Japan, no. Uh, then she went to Africa, and, and it's like you, you don't think of the United States, but by far, actually, the United States is the third most populous country in the world. There's 310 million of us now. Um, by the middle of the century, there's going to be 400 million of us, um, and uh, um, so. Uh, when you think about, you know, we put it in the context of a place like the Chesapeake Bay, the Fish and Wildlife Service and our state partners have a lot at stake in that great landscape. Well, you know, we're, we're struggling now uh, to restore the Chesapeake Bay and the, the living resources in and around the Chesapeake Bay that we all enjoy and benefit from. Well, drop another five million people into that watershed by the middle of the century, another five million people, um, and so those are the, the 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 those are the things that we're dealing with, and and we really can't affect that. We can't do anything about the rate of population growth or where that population growth is going to go. Um, and the other thing is um, increasing affluence. So we're going to have more people in the world, many more people in the world, and those people are going to be more affluent. Um, the United States, we are, we are going to be more affluent as a country. Certainly the people in China and India and the remainder of Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa are going to be much more affluent. They should be. They, they should have better access to education, uh, to transportation, to uh, health care. Um, uh, the, the, to energy, uh, to uh, uh, cheap and abundant food supplies, and the things that make what we call quality of life. And, and so I think as we look into the future, and it's not the distant future, it's the near future, um, we, are, we are going to see a world that is going to consume more. There's going to be more people and more affluent people, and so we're going to ask more and more of the land and water and air resources uh, that are available. That means for for this guy um, the, the, and 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 uh, those like um, it, um, uh, there will be less. Um, it's pretty much just basic math. Um, and uh, so what we but what we are capable of doing is. Uh, that is, is employing that unique uh, human quality uh, that we call choice. That we, we have the ability to choose, to make good or poor decisions. Um, and so, but I think as a community, what we need to do is be preparing ourselves to make those choices. We can't save everything, everywhere. It's, it's it, again, it goes back to basic, that basic math. More people, more affluent people, means that we will be using more food, more fiber, more fuel, more water, and that means there's going to be less uh, to go around uh, for everybody else. Um, so I think as we look at those challenges and then we 
put those in, again in the context of the physical and political environment within which we work, um, we have to be better. Um, and we, uh, as individuals, um, as organizations, as professions, um, we're going to have to be better. And we're going to have to be better at setting objectives, making choices about what we can, uh, what we can affect and what we cannot affect, um, and, and then pursuing those choices. And so the work that you do, the work, the organizations that, that you represent, uh, the idea of coalition that you embody are more important than they have ever been before. And, as, um, and so in the, in the Fish and Wildlife Service, these are kind of organizing principles that we are uh, trying to um, live um, in that we have to be willing to make difficult choices. We have to be building the capacities that are going to be necessary uh, to make those choices. Um, the uh, state wildlife action plans and the information and the capacity they represent are a key piece of that puzzle. Um, we are um, working to catalyze a network of landscape conservation cooperatives, which we envision as a partner-driven scientific and technical capacity, seamless capacity um, nationally and internationally that will allow us to see uh, wildlife populations and habitat across broad landscapes, but target work to the site scale, which is where um, we, we have to be able to target to the site scale if we're going to be um, successful. So if we're going to have a vision that is one uh, where we are going to conserve uh, wildlife and habitat across broad landscapes, number one, we have to set priorities. We have to identify objectives. What are we trying to do? Um, and then we have to build the scientific and technical capacity uh, to do it together. And that's uh, what we're trying to do in catalyzing this, uh, land, this network of landscape conservation cooperatives. Um, I think we have to be uh, more skillful in demonstrating uh, success. Um, and, and I think that is going to be a key quality in, in our success moving forward is that again, we can show that we can, uh, we can choose an objective and one uh, which I like to talk about uh, today is sage grouse, for instance, that we can see an objective across 11 states um, that, we can, uh, that we can mobilize ourselves um, among the 11 states and the Fish and Wildlife Service and the Bureau of Land Management and the U.S. Forest Service and the Natural Resource Conservation Service, and we can, we can enunciate an objective and we can achieve that objective. Um, um, and, and while uh, we are also achieving other important objectives around um, agricultural commodity and, uh, and traditional and renewable energy and um, transportation planning. And so I think that we have to do a better job of um, enunciating success. I think that, um, um, I think that we have to, um, uh, we certainly have to uh, have a responsibility to, um, as my one of my, our former directors, uh, Lynn Greenwald, um, is is fond of saying is uh, honoring the past, um, and as we as we prepare to change and meet the challenges of the future, it's important uh, to um, to honor the success and learn uh, from the success of the past, and certainly. Uh, one of those successes, I, I can't see, I saw John Frampton here earlier, I can't see John and let the opportunity pass to um, say that, you know, we're in the midst of celebrating the 75th anniversary of the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. And, and what a great opportunity um, to, uh, uh, to put the past into the context of the future. Um, we built um, great organizations. Um, and great professions um, and great capacity to deal with the challenges of the, of the 19th and 20th century. Um, they were successful, um, tremendously 
uh, successful. The Fish and Wildlife Service and the state fish and wildlife agencies are what they are today because of the sport fish and wildlife restoration program. Uh, there's no doubt um, in my mind about that. And so we need to celebrate the success that is the wildlife and sport fish restoration program. We need to use that as a springboard to plan um, and design uh, a future, which is going to be different. Um, it's going to be um, more challenging in many respects, but we have more and better capacities than we had um, uh, back when my father uh, worked um, in the U.S. in his early career um, in the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So, um, so I'm uh, proud to be with you here today um, to celebrate uh, um, uh, success, past success, to celebrate the future, uh, which you are helping us uh, um, uh, bring to bear, um, and to uh, think about how we can uh, be. Um, we can rise to the challenge, we can be optimistic um, that we can deal with these uh, current and future challenges because we have uh, dealt with them um, in the past. And so, again, when, when in thinking about talking to our people, whether it's climate change or invasive species or wildlife disease or any of the many challenges that we're dealing with, um, uh, two <coughs> important qualities. One is uh, personal responsibility which is clear to me that all of you um, have. The idea that, well, I'm going to do my part. It's easy uh, to be, uh, to be um, cynical um, or, um, or depressed, you know, especially given the political environment with, within which we all work. But uh, two important qualities, personal responsibility and optimism, that we uh, can deal with these challenges because we have dealt with them in the past and because uh, we must deal with them. There's, there's no option. Uh, there is no other option. And uh, so I, I want to end by, again, just saying thank you to all of you for everything you do. Thank you for being here um, and uh, taking part in this effort to uh, build a great coalition um, in support of uh, the Teaming with Wildlife effort. And, and I hope that in the days ahead you will see the Fish and Wildlife Service as a, as a great um, and improving uh, partner with you. So thank you very much.